of a medieval mason from whence our rituals derive. Operative medieval masons were not unskilled laborers, but acted as what we would today call civil engineers or architects. They knew and exercised trade secrets of geometry to erect the lasting stone monuments of their day, cathedrals and the castles, which made manifest medieval aspirations. In turn, how did they do that? They directed the part-time, semi-skilled labor who owed debts of allegiance to their liege lord or king, a specified number of days dedicated to working on the king's projects, a kind of taxation paid in the labor. Freedom to travel was therefore uniquely essential to the medieval mason's job and was recognized by the diplomacy of kings as serving the general interest any king who wanted a great castle or cathedral in his jurisdiction had to be able to get masons and promise them freedom to move on to the next monumental job site once completed. So it was that operative masons ended up with a kind of universal passport, unique in its time to travel from county to county and from country to country. We, speculative free and accepted masons, internalized that ancient freedom as a symbol of our motivation travel in foreign countries is what enables us to reap the rewards of our craft. Socially, this means we have a system in place to recognize and accept our brothers from all over the world. Symbolically, meaning goes much deeper to the heart of the combined freedom and power that derives from understanding a universal language of symbolism a passport to travel in foreign countries inside and out. Traveling men teach that language. And in our history are a long line of famous itinerant teachers who tirelessly promote and teach modes of understanding the symbols of our craft, including such well-known lights as Preston Webb and DeWitt Clinton from centuries past. Dr. John Nagy visits us tonight in that same tradition and capacity a life and business coach by trade within the craft. Brother John is well known to us as the author of the seven book series, Building Better Builders. An intensive course of speculative explorations on how to approach the symbols within the blue or symbolic lodge within a prophet. Titles include Building Hiram, Building Boaz, Building Athens, Building Janus, I'm seeing a pattern here, Building Perpins, Building Ruffish, and last but not least, Building cement, the focus of tonight's presentation, or cultivating brotherly love and affection in our next generation of brothers. Please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in a warm welcome for Brother John. Hey. Tonight we're going to be focusing on building cement and Masonic cement specifically. Now, you're probably asking yourself why this particular topic, and I'm going to tell you the story of how it came about. I was in a lodge going through my third degree, and I was shown a working tool, and that working tool was called a trowel. So I was told that this trowel was a, a operative tool to spread cement with. And then I was told but we're not operative, we're speculative. And we're not supposed to spread operative cement, we're supposed to spread this speculative cement, the cement of brotherly love and affection. So I'm looking up at that tool and say, okay, I've got an operative tool I'm supposed to use speculatively on some sort of speculative cement 
But where's the operative cement? Did this ever occur to anyone here to ask the question, where's the cement? I know you probably go back to that commercial, where's the beef? Yeah, same here, where's the cement? So it just absolutely nagged at me. And as usual, when things nag at me, I tend to start looking and researching and I found something. But I didn't find it in the way that most people find things. What I did was I went outside of ritual. I had to go outside the box in order to come back inside the box. I knew the speculative application, but what was the operative materials? Where were they within the craft? Where do I find them? Where were the working materials? I had this trowel, but I didn't have the trough with the stuff that I was supposed to be spreading amongst my brothers. Where's the cement? And I looked it up. Where do you think I looked it up? I went on Wikipedia. I looked under cement. And after several pages of flipping through many, many different links, I came across something called OPC. OPC is a shortened term, an acronym for Ordinary Portland Cement. Now, this is in Portland, Oregon. This is Portland on the other side of the pond. And that's where they developed it. Some guy basically came up with a formulation to bring about what we now use today as common cement. That you mix in with aggregate to create what is called concrete. And the difference between the two is the cement is what holds it together. The aggregate is what you fill in and is bound with the cement. And as I was looking through all this information, it told me that I needed something called lime as a base for this bonding agent. I'm saying to myself, where am I going to find lime in ritual? I don't see it anywhere. And I keep on combing, combing through, and then they tell me that, oh, you're supposed to have silica, alumina, and ferric oxides also in this mix. You're supposed to mix them together a certain way, and that's what you use as the base materials to create OPC. So I'm kind of scratching my head. Where am I going to get lime? I'm looking up. I'm going through what is, in, in Florida, we have something called a catechism. It's a proficiency. And what we do is we memorize what happens to us during ritual. We've got to do this three times because we go through three degrees. And it's a q and A. I'm asked a question. I'm supposed to respond a certain way. So there I am, in the catacombs of my mind, going through three roadmaps, the first, second, and third degree, looking for lime. Did you think I found it at first? The answer is no, I didn't find it. So I said to myself, okay, lime's got to be made of something, right? I mean, you just don't pick it up off the street because it's kind of reactive when you put water in there. So I started asking myself, where do we get lime? And, of course, I looked it up, and it said lime comes from limestone. Gee, limestone. No-brainer, right? But you've got to be able to release the limestone in a certain way, process it, in order to get lime. And I'm going through all the reading, and there's this word that stands out. Chalk. Chalk is made of limestone. Now... If you remember your catechism and remember what you went through, there's a particular point where chalk is mentioned, right? Show of hands, remember? Yeah. And I said, okay, got the lime. <laughs> I'll use the coconut. Oh, sorry. I had the lime. And I knew that if I did something to this chalk, I could get lime out of it. Well, what I found out is you got to heat limestone to about 900 degrees for it to start releasing carbon dioxide. Because limestone, what makes it limestone is the carbon dioxide. It's calcium and carbon dioxide and another bunch of oxide, oxygen molecules. What it comes down to is this. When you start heating it up to about 900 degrees, the carbon dioxide starts being released and it starts converting to lime. So I said, 
okay, I can do this. And then I found out that at about 1,000 degrees centigrade, the stuff starts boiling out like mad. Then I found out that if you heat over 1,000 degrees, something very, very bad happens. What happens is it goes beyond creating lime. It actually creates something called dead burn lime. Now, does dead burn lime work in creating concrete? The answer is nope doesn't work. What happens is when you eat it over that temperature, the limestone, which is then converted to lime, converts to something else that doesn't work really good. And it's called dead burn lime. So you gotta be really careful when you start heating this stuff. And that requires some temperance, and it requires some prudence, some judicial aspects, judgment needs to come in. How do you heat it? That was the next question. I'm saying, myself, okay, I got this lime. I can do the chalk thing with the lime and I can heat it up, but how am I going to heat that chalk? Now, was there something else in ritual that, that I could use to heat chalk? What do you think that could be? Any guess? Charcoal. Bingo. Charcoal is one of the things that I could use to heat chalk. And the interesting thing is that charcoal works really well once you ignite it. In fact, it works so well that it ignites between 650 and 900 degrees. And not only that, but if you stoke it and, and feed it with a lot of air, what happens is it'll go up to 2700 degrees. Now, my temperature range has to be somewhere between 900 and 1000. Do you think I have it covered with charcoal? Show of hands, yes? yes? Yep, okay, we got it. So I've got lime from my chalk using charcoal and making sure that I do the proper heating, making sure it's not too hot, not too cold, just right, the Goldilocks home. And then there was the silicon alum alumina and ferric oxides that I had to deal with. Well, you might be seeing where I'm going with this. And I started looking up, I said, well, I know that there was another material that was mentioned in ritual. Coincidentally, it was also mentioned with charcoal and, and chalk. I said, okay, there was another material. I gotta look up what that material's made of. And lo and behold, I, I looked it up and I found out that clay does indeed contain alumina, silica, and ferric oxides. 